All right, so now we're going to change gears a little bit. We've talked about some of the, just the first aid and toxin types of stuff. Now we're going to talk a little bit about CPR. And what I want to stress before we talk about CPR is that it's not an exact science. Even in people, it is changing all the time. And there's debates on one side of the room. You could have a bunch of VR physicians, and half of them will say, well, cardiac um, compressions are number one, and you don't even have to breathe for the patients. The other half will say, no, you've got to do three breaths per minute. And the other one will say, no, you've got to do 20 breaths per minute. All of that debate is proof that it is not an exact science and nobody knows. But the goals remain the same. We want circulation, we want breathing, um, we want circulation and oxygenation of the blood. Okay? So really what you want to think of when you're doing CPR is you want to mimic the heart and the lungs. You want to mimic that pump of the heart to push blood throughout the entire body to be able to deliver oxygenated blood. Meanwhile, you also want to mimic the lungs. You want to fill the lungs with air. So that air, an oxygenated air, then can be passed through the oxygenated blood to the rest of the body. So it's a twofold process. And people, they're actually getting a little bit away from the respiratory component and focusing more on the cardiac component of, of CPR. That may be due to the reasons why people go into cardiac arrest versus dogs and cats. Dogs and cats, we don't appreciate heart attacks or... Uh, that type of event or arrhythmia is nearly as much as they do in people. People, that's one of the more common reasons for them to have CPR. So in dogs and cats and veterinary medicine in general, we still focus on both cardiac and respiration as equally important. Um, CPR is only to be performed in patients that need resuscitated. If these patients are unconscious, non-responsive, um, if their heart is not beating or they are not breathing, that is when you want to, uh, to start CPR. Okay? Um, chest compressions only if there's not a palpable pulse, if you don't have a heart rate, and breathing uh, only if they're not breathing. Gums are often pale to white uh, or gray, and then a heartbeat may or may not be present. Um, may or may not be present. It's present if the pet's not breathing and you just need to do some breathing for them or give them oxygen support if you're a paramedic or in that field and have access to that. But you do not want to do chest compressions if these patients have a heartbeat. Um, so the, the airway, first thing you want to do is you want to extend the pet's neck. Um, these patients are unconscious, so I do not use a muzzle on these dogs. Um, Again, you're going to get injured if you try to do CPR or any of those types of uh, procedures on a pet that's conscious. Again, these are for unconscious pets only. So, the like people, they have mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. In dogs, we have mouth-to-snout resuscitation. And in cats, we have mouth-to-snout resuscitation as well. One limitation that uh, is theoretical, I don't know that it's been proven, is that our lung capacity is quite a bit bigger than maybe a five pound dog or cat. And so how hard can I breathe and not cause damage? Well, what you want to do is when you're doing mouth to snout compression, is you want to try to see if you can see the chest wall move. That may be very difficult in a hairy dog like a Cairn Terrier or a Husky or something like that. You may not be able to appreciate that movement. But in a five pound animal, you should be able to appreciate that chest while moving. If you're seeing the chest while moving and you're not breathing real hard, you're, you're being effective. When you see that chest wall expanding whenever you're breathing into the pet, you're, you're doing what you need to be doing. So the procedure is to hold the mouth closed Again, Jerry's mouth doesn't close, unfortunately, but you hold the mouth all the way closed with both hands, put your mouth over the snout, and then breathe for the pet, okay? So together like that, and then put your mouth in over the snout and breathe for them. The respiratory rate is variable, anywhere between 10 and 30 breaths per minute. So a breath every two to four seconds is probably appropriate. If you've got access to oxygen, it'd be nice to, to give these patients uh, some type of oxygen supplementation as well. So um, if you've got, I've not seen a good mask yet that fits over the dog's uh, snout or the dog's muzzle. So, uh, that's effective enough to f form a tight seal to where we can breathe and not have leaks and so we can expand the lungs. So most of this is still have to be done by you know, manually and we'll be doing it. In an emergency situation, most of us would do this for our pets. So again, closing the mouth together, put your mouth over the mouth and then do mouth to snout resuscitation. The other um, 
So you want to see the, the chest wall moving. And what we try to do is if there's one person, you're not going to have any problems uh, breathing and doing heart, uh, heart or chest compressions because you can't do them really at the same time. But if there's two people, what you want to do is you want to kind of synchronize uh, the breathing. You don't want to have somebody pressing down on the chest that you're trying to push air into. So try to, to alternate the two, uh, the two procedures. So again, you close the mouth uh, and snout with your fingers, uh, close the lips to seal the airway, and then place your mouth over both nostrils. If you don't see the chest rise, don't stop. I mean, you're doing what you can, and we don't know exactly how effective you are. <laughs> Ideally, you'll see that chest rise when you're pressing or when you're breathing air into the, into the lung cavity. If you don't see that, though, don't stop. Go ahead and continue doing that. Continue to breathe every two to three seconds. Now, there's a variability there, two to four seconds. Really, anywhere in between there is fine. So circulation, yeah, trying to assess, is there a heart rate and is there a pulse? Um, if you're fortunate enough to have a stethoscope, then you're going to listen um, right in the mid-chest cavity, about a third of the way up. Most of us aren't fortunate enough to have that. And so what you can do is just stick your ear up to the chest wall and see if you can hear a heartbeat. In some of these patients, their heart rate may be pretty slow, maybe around you know, 50 or 60. So listen there for a few seconds before you determine if there's a, a heartbeat or not. The other thing you do is you can feel both sides of the chest. If the pet's laying down on the side like Jerry is here, that heart tends to fall to the downside a little bit. So best to feel on the underneath side if there's a, if there's a heartbeat or not. The other thing is that uh, the best place to feel for a pulse is on the inside of the back leg. There's an artery that goes right on the inside of the back leg called the femoral artery. It's a very large blood vessel, and in most dogs and cats, you can fill that vessel quite easily. We have a little... Um, demonstration hooked up here that'll help you feel it or determine what it feels like. So after the presentation, if you want to come up, you can actually feel that pulse and feel what it should feel like. Um, the, so you want to make sure that there's a heart beat or a heart rate or a pulse rate. If you don't hear a heart, but you can feel a pulse, the heart's beating. Okay? So if you have either one of those, then that circulatory system is functioning at least partially. If it's not functioning, though, what we need to do is we need to do chest compressions. And cardiac compressions, chest compressions, are at a faster rate than the breathing. So oftentimes I'll do two or three chest compressions or four per breath if it's just one person doing the, uh, the, the resuscitation. Even if these patients are not breathing and you are unable to start breathing for them initially, cardiac compressions are extremely important to get the, uh, to get the circulation flowing. Um, these patients that are uh, close to death, whenever they're about to die, they'll have what he's called agonal breaths. It's gasps of breath. That's actually enough to get quite a bit of air and oxygen in their lungs. And so if for some reason you're unable to do any type of mouth to snout resuscitation, chest compressions still should be done. And it's very important that we would do those. So where do we press and how do we do it? Um, Similar to what we talked about with the Heimlich maneuver, um, you're going to treat small dogs and cats different than you are large dogs. In small dogs and cats, typically what I end up doing is I either do, uh, I typically do compressions with one hand. Um, especially, of course, if it's kittens, it's going to be like two finger. But uh, when you get into puppies or into, say, 10, 15 pound dogs, you probably, uh, or cats, you can do one handed resuscitation. First of all, to identify where the heart is located. What you want to do is you can take the leg that's up and you can just pull it back over the chest cavity. Where the point of the elbow crosses the chest cavity, it's about the fifth rib, that's about where the heart's going to be located. Okay? So when I move the, the, the leg back and forth, where this elbow crosses the chest cavity, which is right here, that's about the area where the heart's going to be. And then if you start at the bottom and you start going up, about a third of the way, that line is where the heart's going to be. So you just make an X in that spot, and that's where you want to do your chest compressions. Now, the chest is a pretty large cavity in most patients, and re relative to heart size, the chest is a fairly good-sized cavity. So you really need to compress that chest cavity. Just doing small compressions is not going to get uh, effective circulation. Unfortunately, uh, some of these patients you do chest compressions on, if you do an autopsy on them, some of them are going to have quite a bit of bruising and then sometimes even fractures from doing the compression so violently because we're really trying to achieve full compression. 
We have to think of it, though, that these patients really have no alternatives. They are going to die if we don't do something. And so a broken rib in the, in the long uh, scheme of things is not that bad. So what we do is after we identify where this, uh, the heart is, you have a, go a third of the way up, you go where the elbow crosses the chest cavity, then we want to do chest compressions. And in uh, the smaller dogs or cats, the one hand compression is typically your hands like this over the, the V of the sternum or the chest cavity, and you're doing compressions like that. That'll probably be efficient uh, or sufficient for maybe five pounds and under. Once you start getting bigger than that, you really can't get good compression of the chest or of the heart with just one hand. So even a 10-pound dog or a 10-pound cat, then we're probably going to want to do it a little bit different. At that point, I'll use my hand as a stabilizer on the bottom side, my other hand as the compressive force on the top side and bring those two together. So I would put my hand underneath, my other hand on top, and then do chest compressions that way. Okay, and that's going to be for, you know, probably anything over 10, 15 pounds. Uh, use your best judgment. If we have a 10-pound barrel-chested dog that's around, I mean, you really can't get your hands around the chest cavity to do chest compressions. You're going to have to do two-handed compressions, okay? And then, finally, when we have the larger uh, dogs, then what we're going to do is full two-handed compressions. What I like to do is you find yourself slipping off of the chest cavity a lot. It's very difficult sometimes to hold your hand stable on the chest cavity. So what I'll do is I'll make one hand a fist where the bottom side is relatively flat. I'll put that right over the area where I think the heart is or where the heart should be. I'll take my other hand and press, press it on top. And then you're doing full chest compressions, okay? And you're doing them hard. If you're on a table like this, if we're in an emergency situation, emergency room, then actually what we will oftentimes do in the ICU is actually stand on the table so we can get some leverage. So if you can have these patients on the ground where you can be on top of them and really put your weight into it and really get some leverage, that's probably a good thing uh, to do to really effectively get some circulation. Well, how do you know if you're doing a good job or not? Unfortunately, most of the time you don't. In theory, you should be able to feel a pulse, okay? You should be able to put your hands back here to where that femoral artery is. And again, I'd encourage you to come fill this so you kind of know what you're looking for. And you should be able to feel a pulse every time we're doing chest compressions. That doesn't happen very often, though. And I don't know if that's just because we're inadequate in doing that or if we're not getting, uh, you know, 100% best blood pressure so we're not feeling a pulse or not. Most of the time in our patients that we're doing it, I can't feel a pulse that's back there. Um, one other thing, and this is just a little caveat that, that some are, are thinking is, is more critical, um, something called CPCR. With that extra C, it means cerebral. Trying to get cerebral or brain circulation, uh, the brain needs the oxygen the most out of any of these organs that we're dealing with, and it's the first to fail. And so what some people will do, if you've got plenty of people to do it or if you're in the, uh, the medical field and you're able to, is trying to do some type of compression of the abdominal cavity. Uh, that way, when you're doing chest compressions, there's a lot of resistance down at the bottom half of the body. So all of the blood flow then, or most of the blood flow is going towards the top half of the body as the brain. Probably the, the best way of doing that is getting like a towel or and wrapping it very tightly around the abdominal cavity. The other thing you could do is literally lay on the abdominal cavity, trying to compress it as much as possible so all the blood, or most of the blood, is forced to go to the front of, of the body and up to the brain. Um, most of us are not going to be uh, as astute to do that and to go through all of these steps. So the big things that I would encourage you to know and to be comfortable with is the chest compressions and then the breathing. This is just kind of bonus if you're you know, calm enough to be thinking of it. Now, um, one important thing, and let me see if that just comes up here in a minute or not. We'll just talk about CPR, and then we'll, uh, in a minute we'll talk about normals and kind of how to evaluate your pet for that. Um, so, again, laying your, uh, the pet down on the right side. Again, in some of these, pay, uh, these pets, you're not necessarily going to have to lay them down, especially if it's a small pet. You may have them up on a table or something, and then putting your hand underneath as a base to, uh, to do the compressions against. Um, you know, that's uh, how to find where the heart is by bringing the left elbow up. And then um, half the cycle is in compression and half is in release. So what that means is that we're not sitting here uh, beating as fast as we can. Remember, the heart's a pump. So you've got compression, blood is ejected out of the heart, 
Then you have relaxation. The, blood, the heart has to fill up again with blood, then compression, and then relaxation. Um, and so that's what you want to do when you're doing chest compressions. Um, variable heart rates uh, are normal for dogs. Uh, large dogs, typically around 80, sometimes a little bit less for a heart rate. Medium dogs around 100, and then small dogs 120, 140. Um, it gives you a little bit of an idea of how fast we need to be doing these compressions. Um, this is just reiterating the point, this last statement, that chest compressions are extremely important. Uh, respiratory is probably a second, uh, uh, a second to the chest compressions as chest compressions are most important to do.